Hello, welcome to week 5, unit 3, adding parameters to functions. Why do we want to add parameters to functions? As we mentioned earlier, we create functions to make programs more readable and also to reuse functionality in different scenarios. In order to really be flexible with our functions, we provide parameters so that we can reuse the functions in even more scenarios. For example, take the print function. The print function takes the values that are to be printed as a parameter. So we can use the print function everywhere where we want to create some output. We just provide the values that should be printed as a parameter and the print function takes care of outputting them. And the same is true for each and every of the functions we will be creating. We can use parameters to make them applicable in more situations. We will see that functions can have no, one or several parameters. And we will see that we can even specify optional parameters and default values so that our functions become even more flexible and easy to lose. Again, we will do this in our Jupyter Notebook. So at showtime, let's switch over to the Jupyter Notebook. In this Jupyter Notebook, we will learn about using functions. As mentioned on the slides already, functions can have no, one, or multiple parameters. And I'll show you this in an example. The following cell here contains two custom functions I created. And the first one, function is called the answer to everything. It has no parameters, so empty parentheses, and we simply return 42. So we can later on use this function to answer the question to life, the universe, and everything. Then I have a second function, which is called sum. Sum takes multiple parameters, in this case two, a and b. They are separated by a comma. And then calculates the sum of a and b and returns it. So let's use these two functions. If I execute it, this program, we see that the answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. And just to repeat this, what happens here is once the execution gets to this line, this function is called. In this case, no parameters are passed, so simply the result value 42 is passed back to print, and print prints the two parameters, namely the string, what is the, life, what is the answer to life, the universe, and everything, and 42, resulting in this result. In the second example, we call the function passing two parameters, 39 and 3. The function is called using these two parameters. The two parameters are added and the sum is returned. And finally, the program prints what is the sum of 3 and 39. And the sum, of course, is also 42. So you see, we can create functions with no one or multiple parameters. Now it's your turn again. There is an exercise. The exercise is to write a function that checks whether a given string is a palindrome or not. A palindrome, for example, is the word Anna, the word Otto, the word race car. These are words or phrases that can be read backward and forward. So if you read Anna backwards, it still reads Anna. The same is true for race car. If you re read race car backwards, it still is race car. The function you create should return true if the parameter passed is a palindrome and false otherwise. Note that there are several approaches to solve this exercise. You could use a loop, but it's really, really complex. Or you could, for example, use slicing. So it's your turn. Pause the video, try to solve this exercise, and I will show you one possible solution afterwards. Welcome back. So let's try to solve this exercise together. What I will do, I will define a function, and this function is called isPalindrome. So that's a convention quite common in programming that if you have a function that returns true or false, you call this function is something. So in our case, isPalindrome. 
And what do we provide to this function? We provide it some word or some phrase. Um, I simply call this parameter s, shorthand for a string. We will get a general string. And what we now need to do, we need to check if the word or the phrase that was passed in is a palindrome. But remember, you can have capital and lowercase letters. So I would love that my function is not dependent if on the case of the text that is um, given to the function as a parameter. So I would like to see that Anna is a palindrome. And to achieve this, we, we need to make sure that case doesn't matter. How can we do this? We can, for example, convert the string to all lowercase. We could use all uppercase as well. I just decided to use all lowercase. So I convert the string we get as a parameter into the same string, just all lowercase. And now I need to check if this string is a palindrome. If it is a palindrome, what I want to do, I want to return true. And else, if it's not a palindrome, I want to return false. So now I only need to implement this check. How could I check if something is a palindrome? Something is a palindrome if it's the same written backwards and forward. So I somehow need a way to turn the string around so it's to be able to use it backwards in my program. And if you remember slicing, you might remember that there was a way to, to create a slice that was reversed. We could use the minus one for this. So one approach to solve this exercise here is to check if the string is equal to the reversed string starting from the beginning till the very end. Starting from the beginning till the very end and using steps of minus one. If you don't remember anymore what this is, I suggest you go back and rewatch the unit about slicing again. This is a slice that contains the whole string just reversed. So we are already done. If the string is equal to the reversed string, we return true. Otherwise, we return false. Let's check if this works. Let's call, and I'll simply create an output here. Let's call the is palindrome function using, for example, Anna first or lowercase. Oh, I have, uh, have a typo. I missed the N here, so let's do this again. And the result is true. Of course, we know that case might play a role, so I do something stupid here. I write Anna with two capital letters in the end, and still we get the true. So our approach, converting the input to all lowercase works. Let's check something else. Let's check race car, for example. And sure enough, race car works as well. What happens if we use the numbers? Although this is true, and now we probably should check the other um, example as well. Let's check if Christian is a palindrome, and this is not the case. So our function seems to work. As mentioned earlier, this is just one possible solution. Yeah? You could create other solutions as well. One possibility would be, for example, one variant would be to return the result of this comparison directly. This would also work, right? Because first, this comparison is evaluated. If it's true, we return true. If it's not the same, we return false. Let's check this. Anna still works. Christian doesn't work. So, 
pretty simple solution using slicing. I know that it was probably quite hard for you to come up with them, a solution like this. Another thing we could have used is there is a reversed function. Instead of using slicing, we could have used reversed. And this takes a string or actually um, a sequence and returns a reverse sequence. So this should also work. Christian is no palindrome. And let's try race car again. Oh, that doesn't work. Oh, I have a little bug in here. Mm. So let's check what reversed actually returns. Reversed. Uh, yes, I need to, uh, that's an iterator. Um, we won't go into detail. Uh, so reversed returns an iterator. We won't go into detail of iterators. So we need to convert this to a string first. I hope this works. No, it doesn't. So probably we would need to do something like this. We need to create a list from it first and then um, and then convert this list back to a string. We have learned about this as well earlier. We could use the join method for this. So I think that should be a possible solution as well. Um, oh, I missed one. So now it works. <laughs> so now you've seen another approach yeah, using the reversed function. It's a little bit more complex because reversed returns an iterator. We need to convert this to a list first, and then we can join it back together into a string. Actually, I think it would also be possible without the list. Let's give it a try, yeah. So that would be another possible solution, yeah? You see, again, there are different solutions possible, either using reversed and the join method, or using um, slicing, or even using a loop. So, it's possible to solve this exercise using different approaches. So let's jump to the next topic, default values. As mentioned earlier, it's possible to define default values for parameters. I've created a little example here. There is a function called multiply by factor, and it has two parameters, the number and the factor. But the parameter factor also has a default value which is assigned using the equal sign and the value. And the result is that I can use this function now in two different ways. Either I can provide five as an argument. So just one parameter, the number parameter is provided. The second parameter is not provided, so therefore the default value is taken. Or I can use both parameters, so provide five and three, and then the factor is not two anymore, but three. Let's execute this. Now see, in the first case, I didn't provide um, any value for the factor. So simply two is used. We got a result 10. Or if I call multiply with factor providing five and three, I get a result of 15. Default values have another nice functionality that is, that we can also just provide a few of the parameters. Um, and that's done when we add the name to the parameter. So, so far we have always called our methods you providing the whole parameter list. But let's have a look at the print function. Yeah? Here is a doc string of the print function. Um, and I copied this over from the Python documentation as well. The print function gets the objects or the values, and then it has quite a few parameters with default values. There's one called separator, then there's one called end, then there's one called file, and so on. Separator is a string that is, you, that is placed between 
the values we provide to the print function. As you've already noticed, whenever you use the print function, you never provided a separator, it was always the default separator space. And you also never cared about the end character. There was always a new line added automatically. But of course, we can provide our own values for these parameters. And that's exactly what I've done down here. So I now used different combinations. I just used the print function as before. Hello Python programming. I used the print function providing a custom separator, in this case a snake. I used the print function providing a custom end character, in this case a thumbs up. Or do both together providing a custom end character and a custom separation character. And note, as soon as I add the name of the parameter to it, I don't have to care about the order anymore. So in the function definition, separator is first and end is second. And if I provide the name, yeah, I don't have to provide the parameters in the correct order. So let's execute this. And you see, yeah, here we have a custom separation character, here we have a custom end character, and here we have both in combination. So you see, using parameters with default values, it's, it's possible to write functions that are quite generic that you can adapt to different scenarios. In case of the print function, to add a new line or not at the end, or to use different separation characters. As a small appendix, a little information on escape characters. You have seen right now several times that we use backslash n to create a new line. Maybe you've already seen also backslash t, which is a tabulator. And all these special characters are so-called escape characters. These characters are introduced always with a backslash and as soon as I have a backslash in a character, the following character has a special meaning. So backslash n is a new line, backslash t is a tabulator. And if you would, for example, like to print a quotation mark, you would also have to escape it so that it's not interpreted as a normal you know, string start or string end. And that you could do using backslash and then the quotation mark. If you like to learn more about escape characters, I've linked the documentation in this um, notebook as well, but just yeah, a little appendix on escape characters here. So after this short, short appendix, let's have a little quiz. Let's try our understanding of what we've just learned. I have a small program here. First, we print the numbers from one to five. No, from zero to five, four, actually. And then we do the same again. And if I execute this, we see that the first zero of the second loop is printed in the same line as the four numbers from the first loop. Why is this the case? This is the case because we changed the end line character here, right? So we tried to write all the numbers in one line and therefore new new line is created and as a result the next thing that is printed the zero is also on the same line. How could we solve this problem? We could for example add a simple print statement here without anything that will create simply a new line and let's execute this uh, and as you see now we don't have the problem anymore. So again it's your turn. We have two exercises here. Exercise one is about implementing factorial. In mathematics, factorial is defined for any non-negative integer and is denoted using the exclamation mark. And what is factorial of a number? It's simply the product of all positive integers up to this number. So for example, five factorial is one times two times three times four times five it's 120. Three factorial, 
therefore is 1 times 2 times 3, it's 6, and 1 factorial is 1. So your task is now to implement a function called fac, which calculates a factorial. And then in a second cell, you should use your function to ask the user for an input and print the output of calculating factorial for the input. Again, as you know it, pause the video, try to solve this exercise yourself, and I'll show you a possible solution later on. So welcome back. How can we solve this exercise? So one possible example or one possible solution would be this. Let's define our fun function factorial and it gets a number from the user for which the factorial should be calculated. And how can we do this? We need to multiply all the numbers up until the provided number. And we could, of course, use a range for that. So, for every number in the range, now we need to be careful. You know a range starts with zero. We don't want to multiply with zero, as the result would always be zero. So if we start with one, and the range should end with the number, but the end is not included in the range, so therefore we add one to it. So for every number in the range from one up until the number, what do we do? We multiply our result with some number. Therefore, we initialize result with the value one, and now we could calculate the new result. We use a shorthand for it times equals n. So we would multiply result with one, then with two, then with three, and then with four, and so on. And finally, we can return the result. So let's create a new cell and try this function out. I'll um, first ask the user for an input. And I don't do any um, checking of the input, I just assume that it's correct. And then we create the output, print. the factorial of number is, and here we invoke our function number. So let's try this. What is the factorial of three? It's six, so my function seems to work. What is the factorial of five? It's 120, so it seems to work. Currently, our function factorial has one problem. We could also provide a negative number, but for now, that's okay. We just leave the solution here as it is. There is a second exercise as well. In the second exercise, you should create a function to calculate the um, body mass index. I won't be showing a solution to this exercise in the video, but use this exercise again to practice what you have learned so far. So let's jump back to our slides. What have you learned in this unit? In this unit you have learned why using parameters can be useful. You have seen that functions can have one, zero or many parameters. And you have also learned how to use default values for parameters. Thanks for watching and see you in one of the next units.